Good evening. Can you all hear me in the far reaches? Thank you for coming out. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. And tonight is proof that there's life after caucuses, right? <laughs> uh, but we're in a political season. We're going to deal with a very important public policy issue tonight. Uh, and that is poverty, but with a twist you might not think of or, or be, as be familiar with, and that's, of course, suburban poverty. And we have our colleague Elizabeth Kneebone out from Brookings to talk about that tonight. She's the co-author of this book, which you can better see up here if I step aside. Uh, and she says she's going to talk about her research, present some data tonight on Las Vegas and Southern Nevada. And I know we'll, if, if you're true to form, we'll have a great conversation as well at the end. Uh, Elizabeth is with the Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings. So you might not be surprised to know that they study metropolitan regions. And we are one of those. We are the 30th largest metropolitan region in the country. And uh, from Nevada's inclusion in the early primaries, we are the first large city in the country to have chimed in in the primary season. But uh, we'll look at our, our city and region in the context of poverty tonight uh, Elizabeth's making her first trip out here with us at Brookings Mountain West, but like our visitor, she's been talking to faculty here about her research and theirs. She's been speaking in classes, and the topic of poverty is sort of interdisciplinary if, uh, as much as any other topic. So she's met with public affairs classes, uh, social work classes, be teaching an economics class tomorrow. So it's, it's one of the ways that our Brookings colleagues get involved in the region. Let me not forget, for those of you who are note takers in the audience, we already have Liz's PowerPoint up on our Brookings Mountain West website. So give your fingers a little rest if, if you need to. You can just go to the Brookings Mountain West website under lectures and you'll see her lecture and the PowerPoint will pop up. And in a few days, thanks to our great friends in the Greenspan College, the video of the lecture will also be there. So let me bring Elizabeth to the stage, and we'll begin. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming out tonight uh, for this lecture. Uh, as Bill mentioned, I'm with the Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings. And in that program, our work tends to really focus on the 100 largest metro areas in the country. And together, those places make up about two thirds of the nation's population, an even larger share of our national economy. Uh, and we do all sorts of things in the Metro program. We look at things like uh, regional economies, their performance and makeup, uh, transportation and infrastructure, workforce, human capital, a whole range of issues that affect places across the country. In my work, as Bill mentioned, I focus on low-income people and places. And I think the places part is really important because beyond trying to understand uh, the trends of poverty nationally and the dynamics of poverty nationally, I really focus on, on places, on where poor people are living, on where poverty is moving because place matters. You know, where you live affects all kinds of things like what kinds of schools you have access to, what sorts of jobs are near you, are there any services that you can access. And so when you're poor, where you live really makes a difference in determining whether or not you have opportunities or barriers that either help or hinder uh, as you try to get yourself out of poverty in the long run. And the 2000s were really striking because we saw such a dramatic shift in the geography of poverty. Uh, and before I dig into that, although I think the, the title of the book in tonight's talk is really giving it away, that suburbs have become home to the largest and fastest growing poor population in the nation. Uh, I do want to start by just saying a bit more about terms, about what we mean by suburbs or cities. Uh, and I mentioned again that we look at metropolitan areas. We're using the census definition, the Office of Management definition of, of uh, metropolitan statistical area. So they're looking at population centers and commuting sheds, basically, so regional labor markets. And that's at the county level. Those are built out of counties. So when we break those counties, those places up into cities versus suburbs, we look at the top 100 metro areas and we first determine what a city is. Uh, and there is, because there is no one statistical definition of suburb, the way we go about this is by choosing the first named city in the Metropolitan Statistical Area title, 
and any other city that shows up in the MSA name that is an incorporated place with a population of 100,000 or more. So in this region, the Las Vegas-Henderson region, both Las Vegas and Henderson are treated as central cities or urban areas in our analysis, and the remainder of the metro area is suburban. Um, I'll also include that beyond the 100 metro areas, if we want to get a national look uh, at these trends, we break the remainder of the country into small metro areas and the non-metro portion or the rural portion of the country. And if we take a look at what's happened uh, in recent years, we see that poverty has grown across all of these kinds of places. The 2000s were really remarkable for the rapid growth of poverty. Poverty rose to, to historic levels in terms of the number of people living below the federal poverty line. And that's another good note, that we're using the federal poverty line, uh, which is the same measure across places. It doesn't change based on where you live or cost of living. And in 2014, for a family of four, that was roughly $24,000. So in some ways, this is even an, uh, maybe a conservative estimate of how many place, p places and people may be struggling economically. But what we saw by that measure is that poverty rose across all kinds of places, but the fastest pace of growth, as I mentioned before, was in suburban communities. And as suburbs saw poverty grow so rapidly, 65% between 2000 and 2014, uh, that's more than twice the pace of growth that occurred in big cities that anchor our major metro areas, we passed a tipping point for the first time as a nation. So now there are more poor residents who live in suburbs than in big cities or in rural communities or in smaller metropolitan areas. A one third, more than one third of our nation's poor population lives in the suburbs and more than half of our poor population in the top 100 metro areas. What's been remarkable about this trend, besides its magnitude and how fast it happened, is that it's something that touched almost every major metro area. Uh, um, almost every major metro area saw their suburban poor population grow in the 2000s, and many by really large, significant margins. It's happened across all different kinds of places, and in fact now the majority of our major metro areas, almost two-thirds of them, have more poor residents living outside their central cities than in them. And these are places that we've long associated with urban poverty, like Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, all past this tipping point where uh, suburbs now make up uh, the largest poor population. It's also happening in stronger markets like Seattle, the Bay Area, Washington, DC. Again, that's where the, the fastest pace of growth in those regions were uh, in, in poverty, it was in the suburbs. So this is a, this is a trend that has touched uh, all regions of the country and uh, this region is also remarkable for this trend because in, in many ways it's ahead of the curve. It happened even faster than we saw nationally. So if we look at the Las Vegas region, between 2000 and 2014, the poor population in the suburbs grew by 123%, so more than doubled over a very short span of time. And again, it's not that poverty in the city didn't grow. In fact, it doubled as well. It's just that the, the suburbs were home to the fastest pace of growth. What's also really important here is that often I think we, we think of the Great Recession and its impact, which it definitely exacerbated these trends, but you can see by this chart that this was a long-running trend that happened well before the, the collapse of the housing market. That sh shift towards the suburbs had already taken place. Uh, and we'll dig into more about why that happened in just a moment, uh, but uh, what does this mean for, for poverty rates as well? Right now, so far, I've been talking about the poor population. Nationally, what we've seen is poverty rates still remain higher in big cities than in suburbs, though both have grown uh, steeply in recent years. In this region, we're really seeing about the same share of the population living below the poverty line, 15%. And that's a number that really hasn't budged since uh, recovery set in. It's really stuck at that post-recession high, which is the case for most major metro areas and most suburban communities across the country. I think another uh, important piece to this puzzle is that as poverty has spread out, it hasn't necessarily done so evenly, and it's moved well beyond the sort of inner ring suburbs just over the city line. Uh, you can see this is a tract level or neighborhood level poverty rates in 2000. If we go to the most recent year of data, which is the 2010 to 2014 period, you see a number of places have darkened, have, have uh, crossed uh, the next level of poverty from 10 to 20 percent or 20 to 30. And in fact, a number of places have also crossed over that 40 percent threshold, well beyond the, the central city, but, but further out in the metropolitan region as well. I think that really underscores the regional nature of this challenge and the growing prevalence of concentrated poverty, which is in its own way uh, a growing concern and challenge because then residents aren't just struggling with their own individual poverty, but the challenges of being poor in a very poor place. And increasing 
increasingly those challenges are not just urban, but again, shared by suburban communities as well. So why is this all happening? Why have we seen this rapid rise in poverty? Uh, there are a number of factors that we looked at over the years in trying to unpack this and understand these trends. Broadly speaking, you can think about the poor population in suburbs growing because more poor residents are moving to suburban communities uh, and because more suburban residents are becoming poor over time. So there are a number of different uh, ways that, that we can start to unpack those two large dynamics. One, just looking at population change generally, this region has seen booming population growth in the cities and suburbs, but you can see it's been particularly fast in the suburban portion of the region. And as these suburban places have added population, they become more diverse, both economically and demographically. You know, a piece of that growth and that growing diversity is immigration. You know, increasingly as new immigrants have come into metropolitan regions in the US, they've bypassed central cities altogether and moved directly to suburban communities. Uh, but what we see with these numbers is that's a piece of the puzzle, but it's actually a fairly small piece. Uh, in this region, only about 22% of the rapid rise that we've seen in, in suburban poverty was uh, from the foreign-born population. This is largely uh, a native-born phenomenon in this region and nationally uh, that we've seen driving this trend. And so why, why else are people moving to the suburbs? Some of this is about the housing market. Uh, you can think about this in a number of ways. In some uh, communities, housing has aged and become affordable over time. Uh, or in the case of portable subsidies, we've seen an increasing use of vouchers, uh, these, these portable housing subsidies being used in suburban communities, a shift towards the suburbs. Uh, but we've also seen the impact of, of course, the foreclosure crisis and the subprime uh, crisis. In the mid-2000s, the sort of subprime boom, uh, the bulk of loans in this region and nationally occurred in uh, suburbs of our major metro areas. And then once the foreclosure crisis hit, when the bottom dropped out, the bulk of foreclosures were also in suburban communities. So that, that's definitely uh, had, had an outsized impact on, on suburban communities in recent years. But it's also not just about housing, it's about jobs, too. Uh, and one way it's about jobs is where are jobs located? Uh, in this region, just like others across the country, we've seen jobs shift away from downtown. They're moving outward uh, in the metro area. Now, one thing I will note about Las Vegas is it is actually much more centralized than the average large metropolitan area, partly because of your geography and, and the sort of hemmed in nature uh, of the region. But it is, it is more centralized. Even still, it has not been immune to these trends. We've still seen jobs shifting away from downtown. And when you start to break this out and look at different types of jobs and different types of industries, the most centralized or the, uh, the more centralized on average tend to be industries with a lot of lower skill, lower paying jobs, service sector industry jobs, um, construction jobs. So jobs that may pay lower wages, but also jobs that were hit very hard uh, in the economic downturn. Um, what we can see even still years into economic recovery is the, the suburbs here are home to just about twice as many unemployed as they were before the recession hit. Um, so partly because of the housing-led nature of this downturn, uh, we saw the suburbs bear the brunt of this downturn more so than in past recessions. But I will emphasize once again, as I said in the beginning, this isn't just a recession story. This really is about larger shifts, larger dynamics happening in addition to the, the impact of the economic cycle. Because we can see even now the structural shifts that have occurred in our economy and are continuing to take place, uh, which affect these trends. So for instance, uh, in the, uh, the growth of low-wage jobs and the, the larger share of the economy made up by low-skilled jobs. You know, in the recession, middle-skilled jobs, uh, we shed those at a faster pace than lower-skilled jobs and lower-paying jobs. But in recovery, we've been growing lower-paying lower jobs at a much faster pace. So this is a situation where you may have somebody working, maybe working full-time, but not earning enough to get above the poverty line. And a lot of those jobs and a lot of those workers are in suburban communities. So that's just to underscore that even into economic recovery, we don't expect uh, to see these trends disappear. These are long-run challenges that suburbs are going to continue to deal with alongside cities. So why does this matter? Um, why, why should we be concerned or, or, or pay attention to the rapid rise of poverty in suburban communities? Because you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. If someone is poor in the suburbs and they find themselves living in a community where there are good schools, where there are low crime rates, 
uh, affordable housing, good jobs. That's, that's an excellent situation for a family to find themselves in because that means they have access to opportunities that can provide a pathway out of poverty over time. The challenge is that when we've seen poverty grow so rapidly in recent years, it's often not happening in those communities. It's often happening in communities that don't necessarily offer those sorts of, of opportunities or that aren't equipped to deal with the rapid rise in need uh, that they're now experiencing and seeing. So there are a number of ways that that can, uh, in some ways, offer additional barriers and, and make it even more challenging uh, to address poverty in a suburban context. First, consider transportation. Suburbs are, more, uh, are less likely to have access to public transit in the first place. And for low-income residents who live in the suburbs who do have access to public transit, they're less connected to jobs than their urban counterpart. Uh, and that's a concern, as we know that jobs are shifting outward and poverty is shifting outward, but often not in the same places. That raises concerns of spatial mismatch. How do you make sure that people are connecting to the kinds of job opportunities that can help them improve their economic uh, situation? And it's not just about jobs either. Some of the challenges that we see in the suburban context uh, are around the safety net. That suburbs often have a much thinner and patchier safety net to begin with, and now they've seen this rapid rise in need uh, that I really haven't been able to keep pace with. So in this region, actually, you see a very similar number of registered nonprofits who I, I've called here low-income serving nonprofits. So nonprofits that deal with things like um, food security uh, or uh, emergency assistance, uh, housing. Uh, so addressing human service needs of the low-income population. The challenge is, you know, the suburbs here spread over greater distances. And once again, if you don't have a reliable car or access to transit, it can make it that much harder to connect to really important services that can help you weather a downturn uh, or, or find some more security or stability for your family. Another challenge that we've heard a lot from providers across the country, particularly in the post-recession period, is that they've seen rapid increases in need and many more people coming through the doors who've never had access or had to connect to the safety net before. It's not like their budget's expanded. To, to meet that need. And in fact, in a budget constrained environment, particularly following the recession, they're also often in the position of trying to do more with less. So it's put a real strain on what safety net capacity is there uh, when what was there may have already been patchy and thin to begin with. Some of this also reflects some of the lags that we've seen in funding, philanthropic funding, government funding, which really hasn't kept pace with the geographic shifts and where poverty is. And it makes it that much more challenging to try and build or expand capacity in these areas that are now experiencing really rapid and high levels of need. Uh, and on the front lines of those sort of issues are often schools. So uh, in this region and as we've seen across the country, the free and reduced price lunch population has grown at a faster pace in suburbs than in cities. And often, again, these schools may be in a context where the, the safety net around them isn't very thin or, or isn't very uh, robust. Uh, and many schools that we've talked to in districts across the country have found themselves in a position of, of needing to try to become the hub that brings some of those providers and some of those partners into the community, whether it's um, a food pantry or clothing pantry, thinking about things like a dentist or medical services, uh, addressing basic needs uh, before they can even get to sort of the academic goals uh, that they are tasked with. Uh, and again, doing this in a really resource-constrained environment, but trying to catch up to, to the rapid shifts in need that they've been seeing. Uh, that may seem like a lot of challenges, and I'm not done. I have a few more to, to list, because this really is a complex and difficult situation that many of these communities are finding themselves in. In addition to all the things that we just talked about, um, there's often a lack of capacity in suburbs beyond the nonprofit safety net that I was just talking about or the philanthropic funding picture. The, the suburbs themselves often lack the staffing capacity or expertise or, or long-term experience that, that cities have often built to deal with these challenges. And now they're in a position of trying to play catch up uh, and, and scrambling to, to meet the growing need. There are also, also often governance challenges in the suburban context. In some regions, that means fragmentation. You know, you have several small jurisdictions who uh, are competing for similar resources or just aren't the right size or scale to address some of these challenges and don't have the budget and capacity. Uh, and in other places, I think, or often a common challenge is, whose job is it? to deal with these challenges in the suburbs. It's not like a big city mayor or city council uh, that you know this is, this is part of your mandate. In the suburbs, you may have multiple jurisdictions, multiple areas or communities that you're talking about. And sometimes it's unclear who, who should be tasked with this leadership or who should take the charge uh, in, <coughs> in addressing these issues. 
And finally, of course, money is always a, is a real challenge here, that we haven't seen resources grow uh, to meet the need. And the resources that we do have are often inflexible and sometimes unreliable given funding cycles and, and the great demand for those resources. So for instance, we can look at this at the federal level to just sort of illustrate what we mean by, by sort of a difficult to navigate funding stream and funding landscape. We took a look at the federal uh, programs that address poverty in place, so place-based anti-poverty programs that leave aside things like the EITC or food stamp sort of national programs uh, that don't really depend on where you live, uh, and think about programs that are delivered in places or are place-focused. And we found that there's actually a significant amount of money spent through these programs, about $82 billion. But that money is fragmented across 10 different agencies and 81 different programs. So that's already a very difficult uh, landscape to navigate, particularly in a community where you may be lacking capacity uh, or, um, or the experience in dealing with these programs. Another challenge that comes up for suburbs is many of these programs, in fact, most of these programs were designed with a very different geography of poverty in mind. They were really designed thinking about distressed inner city places and so don't always map easily onto the suburban landscape or into the suburban context. Um, with all of these challenges in mind, I do want to say there's a silver lining. And a lot of the, the, what we've seen in terms of progress, in terms of innovative thinking and action around these issues, it's not coming from the federal level. It's often not coming from the state level. It's coming from local places. It's coming from cities uh, and suburbs and regional leaders who are recognizing these issues and challenges and trying to find new ways to grapple with today's scale of need uh, and poverty in their communities. Uh, and our travels across the country as we've talked to these leaders in these places, we've seen they're arriving and evolving in very different ways and leadership is coming from different places depending on the community uh, or the region. In some places it might be elected officials, in others it's philanthropy uh, or a strong nonprofit. But the case is that in each of these regions there's somebody that's sort of playing the quarterback role. They're figuring out a way to sort of weave together this really fragmented landscape of funding streams at the federal, state, local level, trying to pull in philanthropic and private dollars and braid them together in a way that they can work uh, more effectively and stretch further to help more people in more places. And I want to talk through just a few examples that we've seen uh, of this sort of work in practice. Uh, but what, you'll hope, what I hope you'll notice in the sort of common threads that we've seen coming out of all of these disparate and very different types of models uh, is that they're all figuring out ways to do three things. They're achieving a better scale, so geographically or in terms of the, the scope of issues that they're looking at, they're, they're tackling this at a, at a better scale, a more effective scale. They're figuring out ways to collaborate, to collaborate and integrate. So they're cutting across jurisdictional boundaries and policy silos to come at this in a more collaborative and integrated way. And finally, they're figuring out ways to fund more strategically. So in this very uh, strapped budgetary environment, how do you take what resources there are uh, and use them in ways that really do help more people in more places? A lot of that comes down to figuring out how to use data effectively to both target where the needs are and where they're moving and also measure what's actually working so that we can make sure that we're investing in uh, what sort of strategies will produce the best outcomes for people in cities and suburbs alike. So what does this look like in practice in a, f in a few different places around the country? First, there's an organization in Houston. It's a nonprofit called Neighborhood Centers. This organization is more than 100 years old. Uh, it came out of the Settlement House movement. Uh, but what makes it really unique is how it has adapted and evolved to address the scale of needs in Houston today. So over the last 20 years, they've really put a focus in uh, working regionally. This is a place that operates across 70 different sites in the cities and suburbs of the region. Uh, and also, they have found a really effective scale in terms of programming that they're able to offer. They operate 35 different federal programs, and they take those federal programs and blend them together with more flexible philanthropic and private dollars so that they create a really seamless experience for the families that they're serving. So when a, when a family walks through the center that is in their neighborhood in, in um, the city of Houston, or whether it's in Pasadena, a suburb of Houston, what they get is a personalized experience. Uh, they can figure out what is they're eligible for, for that person, for that family, and then help them access those programs in one place. What's also been really successful about this program and this approach is that they're not using a cookie cutter 
type of approach to say each center looks the same, each center offers the same options, because these communities are different and the needs of the communities are different. So they really invest time and resources in getting to know each community, in doing data collection and gathering and talking to the residents who live in these areas. And when they talk to them, they don't say what's wrong with your community, what's broken, what doesn't work in your community. They take a very affirmative approach to saying what are the assets in your community? What are your dreams for your community and for your families? And by building that sort of more affirmative vision, that's how they begin to shape the programs and, and uh, services that they make available in the different places. And it's their scale that allows them to do this, that allows them to work in this more targeted uh, and tailored way. And in doing so, they often collaborate with providers who may have an expertise in a particular area that they don't have in-house. Uh, they're able to sort of weave together these partnerships as well to create that seamless continuum of services for residents. <coughs> Another example uh, that we have, so that one was a nonprofit model that, that we saw in Houston. This one is one that really came sort of spearheaded by the county in Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, which is a suburb outside of Washington, DC. It's one of the wealthiest counties in the country. Uh, it's also where a lot of the poverty has grown most quickly in the DC region. They face a particular challenge there because in that context, it's often hidden, the poverty in that, in that area. And, and this is a community that's experienced a rapid rise in need, but also a rapid diversification as well. In the 2010 census, they uh, tip to majority minority county. They have a large immigrant population. So the county saw uh, the changing uh, makeup of the residents in the county. And they saw the rapid rise in need, particularly following the Great Recession. And their concern was that there were more people falling through the cracks who weren't connecting to services that they knew uh, could help. So the Department of Health and Human Services, the Office of County of Community Partnerships, got together with grassroots organizations, um, a network of faith-based community providers, um, and strong nonprofits in the county and created the Neighborhood Opportunity Network. So this is a collaboration across sectors and policy areas uh, with the intent of improving connections to the safety net for, for the growing uh, residents in need. Um, in doing this, they really they started with data. They figured out where are the places where we're really seeing the hot spots, the overlapping of multiple indicators showing need. So rising unemployment, um, rising free and reduced price lunch population, and by doing so, they identified seven zip codes that were high need areas within the county. And they targeted three of them to start this, this network as a sort of pilot. In doing that, what they did was to create a, stream, a streamlined uh, interface for, for residents to come and connect to services. They chose community connectors who were residents from the community living in these, in these uh, communities and part of the populations they were targeting. So they, they would have culturally competent caseworkers, essentially, so that when someone walked through the door, they could tell their story once and be able to understand what county services they were available, what were available to them uh, and what other nonprofit services they could access. The county also knew that one reason some people weren't coming in is that there's a distrust in some, in some aspects that people don't necessarily want to go to the county or they don't trust uh, that government uh, entity as the first point of entry. So they made a choice to put those community connectors into trusted nonprofits who are already working with and had relationships in the community. Um, so again, a really integrated approach across uh, public and private partners Part of this, too, was building awareness in the community through door knocking campaigns with community members to let people know what resources were available. Uh, and they also created community circles to try and not just make the network about public services and private services, but in these fast changing communities to build more community connections among neighbors so that they would also have a secondary support network. Uh, so there was a real grassroots com uh, component built in that really helped uh, increase the reach and success of the network. And a final um, example that I want to share is, is from King County. It's from the Seattle metropolitan area. Uh, and this is, this is where education takes the lead uh, in terms of the, the collaborative approaches that we've seen. So in South King County, this is an area, even in a very uh, uh, economic kind of powerhouse that the re Seattle region is, uh, they've seen poverty grow very rapidly as well in recent years. And a lot of that poverty growth is concentrated in the south part of King County, in South Seattle and in the south suburbs. Uh, they're seeing um, a large refugee resettlement population in that community. There's a large immigrant population in that community. 
the housing price pressures and gentrification that's happened in Seattle is pushing longer term city residents south to look for affordable housing, which is a lot of is concentrated in that part of the region. There is also where a lot of the low wage workforce lives. Uh, and so there are long term residents uh, who, are, who are working lower paying jobs or were hit by the recession who, who are part of this growth and need and poverty in that part of the region. So they're seeing a lot of different dynamics and a lot of diversity uh, in their communities. One school district alone had about 3,000 students in their school district and 167 languages. So really grappling with increased diversity and need. But what they realized is that they weren't, it wasn't just this one school district or the neighboring school district, they were all facing these same challenges. So rather than trying to go it alone or, or worse, compete, continue to compete for what resources were available, uh, they created the Roadmap Project. And this is a, co a collaboration among six suburban school districts and the south side of Seattle. They came together with an agreed upon goal to uh, increase or to close achievement gaps and, and improve outcomes uh, for the students in their school district. They're taking a collective impact model. It's a cradle to career approach, so they have a whole continuum, a whole pipeline that they're working on to improve outcomes. And education is the focus, but in doing so, they're bringing a lot of different partners to the table to achieve those outcomes. So they have the public housing authorities at the table. They have local nonprofits and service providers. They have local elected officials and community colleges that are all part of the different work groups that support this collaborative. Uh, in doing this, they were able to uh, 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 successfully uh, attract Race to the Top dollars, a $40 million Race to the Top award that has helped them further this collaborative goals by seeing, uh, for instance, that there's a lot of mobility among low-income families, a lot of housing instability. And as students were crossing uh, boundaries and districts, they were sort of losing track of them and they didn't have a sort of seamless continuum to make sure they were still connected to the wraparound supports that were so important to them. So with this investment and with the money from the federal government, they were able to work on a shared data system that allowed uh, the public housing authority, the service providers, the school districts to follow kids as they moved around. Uh, and also to, to at, even at the same time as they're trying to improve housing stability. But when families have to move, they wanna make sure that they still remain connected to really important services. And they've already started to see, because they're, they're really data focused and measuring their progress and evaluating as they go, they're already starting to see uh, progress towards their goals and the measured benchmarks that they're making. Uh, they also said it's, it's really garnered some healthy competition across school districts. When one school district says, why did their third grade reading scores improve and ours didn't? <laughs> what do we do to try and do more of that? So they're sharing best practices across places as well. So these are just three different examples that I think really help illustrate the variety of approaches and the different leadership that is being uh, shown in, in different places across the country. I think that these sorts of models are also really instructive uh, in terms of lessons learned and what happens next in the policy area as we think about poverty and reducing poverty from a place-based perspective. So we know that the federal government has lagged behind, the states have lagged behind, but we can learn a lot from these sorts of local leaders who are experimenting, who are innovating, who are figuring out what works. Uh, in some ways, just being able to share these models can help other regions replicate when they see common challenges or common situations. Now they have models that they're able to, to learn from uh, and be able to try in their own uh, communities. Uh, it's also about figuring out the lessons learned and what's hard and what are the challenges in these situations so that we can lift that up to improve federal policy and state policy. Like we can talk about neighborhood centers and say this is so amazing that they're operating so many programs at once, but because of restrictions at the federal level, uh, they aren't able to integrate their data. They run 40 different data systems to be in compliance with all of these programs rather than being able to really weave them together and follow people across programs and, and cut down on their reporting requirements and red tape. That's a change that the federal government could make to encourage uh, more models like neighborhood centers and help neighborhood centers uh, do its job more easily. So I feel like there are a lot of lessons learned uh, and part of that is just continuing the conversation and making sure the innovation that's happening in places isn't just replicated uh, and spread as it should be, but also really informs state and federal policymakers, the philanthropic uh, and private uh, actors involved in these issues areas how can they best support and uh, encourage a more modernized policy framework to really address today's geography of poverty? Um, 
Finally, I just want to say the stories that I'm telling here and a lot of this information from the book we've put on a website where we're continuing to chronicle a lot of these best practices and help share that information. Uh, and I talked about three today, but you can find several others on here from, from the transit-oriented development perspective or the housing perspective, uh, again, that show these sort of similar, strong, um, scaled, collaborative and integrated and strategically funded approaches that are taking place already today to better grapple with, with the scale of today's needs. And with that, thank you very much. I look forward to some questions. I know we have some questions. I just want to throw out a question to the audience, if I could. We're talking about metropolitan regions, cities, metropolitan statistical areas. Just a little quick quiz. Uh, in the, the, the 50 United States, would anybody care to tell me the, on a per capita basis, because obviously bigger states have more people, but can you, what state has the most people living in what we call an urban area? Nevada. It's actually California, which makes sense when you think about all the huge c cities in California, right? Uh, second is New Jersey, but the state that has the third most people living in urban metro areas, you're living in it. It's Nevada. So don't confuse the size and physical geography of our state with how people actually live and what they, the challenges they face. So with that little factoid, I saw some hands. Who would, sir? Uh, my name is Lada, I'm one of biology students over here. I wanted to ask you specifically, you mentioned a lot of the, you know, kind of contributing factors to the poverty line, uh, you know, it's a very serious, but the one thing I heard, the reoccurring theme that you keep speaking about is the housing situation. Do you see that being as one of the major factors that are coming into it because, you know, just the difficulty, again, if you don't have a full-time job, you can't necessarily pay for your housing, and that really comes at the bottom of Maslow's, you know, hierarchy of needs, so. Uh, no, I think, I think housing is a, is a critical piece of this puzzle. I mean, I, I would say the economy is, is a leading factor. You know, how well the economy is doing, what kinds of jobs are available, how much do those jobs pay. Uh, but housing, especially as we think about the spatial distribution of poverty, about where people locate and cluster and live, housing is a really big piece of that because where can you afford to live really, really dictates a lot. And a lot of people, you know, the lower your income, the less choice you have in that matter. And then you wrap on top of that transportation costs, even if you have to move further out for an affordable place, then you're struggling with higher transportation costs often as well. Uh, so, so it's definitely a critical issue and really important as we think about trying to increase access to higher opportunity neighborhoods, the housing piece has to be front and center. You mentioned that uh, in Las Vegas during the recession, we lost middle skill, middle wage jobs and what we've added are low wage, low skill jobs. Can you say more about that? Give some examples. That's actually, that's, that's true nationally. That was sort of a, a national um, statistic. The, what we've seen though is when we look at, again, nationally, the sort of projected faster growing occupations often are in service industry areas like um, home health aids or child care beyond just the traditional sort of retail and, and food service types of occupations you think about you know home health aids are a really rapidly growing part of the economy but that's something that might pay twenty thousand dollars a year um, so so there are the, the, the low wage occupations actually crosses a wide range of, of different types of services sure. so your distinction between city versus suburb or urban core versus periphery, because mm -hmm. you know, especially the geographic distribution within metro areas, those poverty can be very sensitive to how you define it. Mm -hmm. Especially in some of those big metro areas like Chicago with multiple counties, like nine counties, 11 counties, depend, depending on how they define it, versus we have only one single county here. Clark County is a one single metro right. area. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that, because uh, for instance, here, I mean, I, I was a little bit curious about how you define the actual core versus uh, periphery or the suburb here in Las Vegas case. Do you, it sound like, you know, you use the city of Las Vegas as a city and the rest as a suburb. Las Vegas and Henderson Las Vegas are considered Vegas. city or the urban portion. As you know, we are sitting here in Paradise, which is county unincorporated. Mm -hmm. Most of the jobs on this trip, the people are commuting to suburb, 
based on your distinction. Then. That's right. That can be a little bit problematic when you apply the same type of definition in terms of city versus suburb. So that's something that you have to consider. Yeah, absolutely. The, the definition issue is, is, is when we come up against, you know, I, I've mentioned this in, in conversations earlier this week too, whenever you have to draw a line, there are challenges with that. Um, what we can say is that other colleagues working in this area and other times that we've cut the data differently, the broader trends still hold. There really is this dispersion of poverty that's happening, whether you treat it just with one central city, whether you expand the definition of what city is, that this really is something that, that appears to be a true, a true thing that's happening. What might change is the magnitude or total numbers that we're looking at, but in general, that, that growth beyond the urban core really is in this region and in others happening. And I think some of that shows up on the map that I had showed up earlier at the census track level, that even beyond par where Paradise is clustered or, or uh, that urban core of, this, of, the, of the county, you're seeing farther out places start to, to tip past higher and higher rates, uh, 10%, 20%. Once you hit 20%, that's where research has shown, that's where you start to see the challenges of concentrated poverty emerge. Uh, and there are a number of, of communities outside even if, even if you included paradise in that too, you're starting to see that disperse as well. So this, this more regional frame really is a challenge um, across, across places. I think you know, related to that, what is more interesting for me is not necessarily the dichotomous you know, poverty distribution between city versus suburb, more like you know, along the suburban community, there's a growing heterogeneity mm -hmm. in terms of the wealth distribution, in terms of the poverty distribution. <laughs> That's right, and I didn't, I didn't present this here, but in the book and in and other um, articles and, and studies we've done on this, we parse out suburbs by type because again that's a, it's casting a really wide net when you say it's just the rest of the metro area because you have more dense places more urbanized places outer lying more rural seeming places uh, and and what we've sh shown, what we've seen by cutting it in different ways is, is older, entering, more urbanized places tend to have higher poverty rates. That's true, and poverty has been growing there. But some of the fastest pace of growth in poverty is in these less dense, more exurban bedroom type communities. And I think, as I mentioned with Montgomery County, that raises challenges too, because it's often hidden. People don't expect it, you know, or they're saying, well, who's moving here? And not realizing it's the person who just lost their job or is facing a cut in wages or hours worked, uh, who've become poor in place uh, or had a medical setback that now has affected their ability to work. Um, and so that's, especially as we think about m mobilizing policy responses, some of those communities, especially ones that are wealthier and traditionally seen as wealthier, are, are um, <coughs> often facing challenges of just getting people to recognize the level of need that they're now experiencing. So increasing diversity. Anybody? <coughs> well, just to follow up on that question, I mean, so I can see why this matters in Chicago or Montgomery County, but, but yeah, does it really matter in Las Vegas? I mean, there's only one county, there's only one school district what, what does it matter if you're a poor person you live in paradise or you have to move over the boundary to the city of Las Vegas? Um, well, so you don't have the fragmentation issue. So that's, that's true. You don't have the fragmentation issue, and that causes a lot of challenges in places like Chicago. But there are still the issues of the further you get away from the urban core, the more of a challenge you have around things like transportation, uh, access to services. So these critical kind of work supports that not only you may find a job, but if you don't have affordable childcare or you don't have affordable transportation, you can't keep that job. Those sort of challenges, I think, become much, much more difficult the, f the further you, away, you move away from the more uh, established infrastructure that you tend to find in more urbanized areas. You can't actually, next month we're releasing um, a study that's using the most recent data up here to look at concentrated poverty, revisit that, and there will be an interactive component that has a mapping function and, and we can help overlay the, the communities there. So we'll circulate that obviously. Uh, so stay tuned, I guess, <laughs> is the message to that question okay. behind you. Sir? Uh, I'm Lawrence Beasley with the Las Vegas Urban League. We provide a lot of social services here in Mountain Valley. In slicing your data, did you also not just take a look at how distribution is laid out spatially, but did you look at it over an age range? We tend to find that the hardest hit now are seniors. And they're having a very difficult time trying to reintegrate after the recession. And all of these factors are um, that is, so uh, 
I can give you the data for the Las Vegas region. It's something we've looked at more broadly. Um, and also to see that this shift that we're seeing is happening across age groups, you know, children, working age, and, and seniors. Seniors actually tilt more heavily to suburbs. Poor seniors tilt more heavily to suburbs than, than other age groups, which again, that raises a lot of challenge. All of these kinds of access uh, challenges, as you, I know, are very familiar with, become even more difficult if they can't drive or they don't have um, you know, a service provider near them uh, and, and obviously aren't as mobile or may not have as many housing choices either. I should know the answer to this question. I don't, so I'm going to ask you. <laughs> you. The slide you showed that said poverty in Las Vegas suburbs grew 123%. Uh, we're, we're used to in the state being at the bottom of many good lists and the top, the top of many 10. bad lists. <laughs> Is that the top of that it's, bad list? It's the eighth. Hey. It's the eighth out of the top 100. Yeah. So there were actually some suburbs there were. harder Austin, hit than us. Austin was, was number one. Uh, I actually think I wrote this down. Who are the ones that are above you? The, um, I know you would know this question. Oh, yeah. Austin, Atlanta, Cape Coral, Phoenix, um, Orlando. So all came in above you for the, for the pace of growth. We compare ourselves to Orlando quite a bit being two large metros whose economy is tourist driven. Mm -hmm. is, is there a connection to be made there? In, I mean, I think, I think especially with the impact of the recession in right. more recent years, uh, we know that those industries were, were hit particularly hard and really <laughs> helped fuel that increase. And as I think we've mentioned before, um, it's not that poverty here wasn't growing before the downturn, it's just that it really took off uh, once unemployment started climbing. Sorry, I didn't mean to monopolize there. Anybody else want to get in the conversation? No? Oh, please. Uh, ma'am, what measures did policy makers in this state of Nevada took to uh, help in this rapid growth of poverty in the state of Nevada? What could they take or? What measures they took or are they thinking? Um, I mean, you may be able to speak about what, what may have been done. Um. Yes, there's, I mean, the, the, the state was dealing with the depths of the recession and the safety net. So one thing the state has done, and we, we've looked at this quite closely, is the relationship of the state to the federal government. And that is in these discretionary areas of funding, not, not defense, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, but where, where your state may or may not get money for health care, uh, social services and things. Nevada has historically done a, a very poor job in getting its share of resources from Washington, D.C. And there are lots of possible reasons for that. It's if, if a state agency gets a $5 million grant and the, and the state government then cuts that agency's budget by $5 million, that's counterproductive to trying <laughs> to, to improve something, right? So the state has formed a, a committee now to look at its federal state relationship. So we're hopeful that Nevada will do a, a much better job of getting its fair share of money. And even s sometimes when Nevada got money, it had to return portions of, grant of the grant monies because it couldn't spend them within you know, the time period of the grant. Uh, we, the state hasn't always applied for all available funds because sometimes you have to match. You know, the, the federal government says, mm -hmm. You know, if you put $5 million into a program, you're eligible to get $10 million. Well, you've got to invest to get some, right? So all these and, and other issues have <coughs> contributed to that fact. If there's a silver lining to such a terrible economic recession as we went through is that it, <coughs> it's forced a, a look at how states and, and metros do business and some things need to be done at the metro level, and Elizabeth went through a lot of the examples, but other things can be done at the state level. So does federal and state and local level work together on that thing? Or? Yes, it's, it's a, uh, it, again, it's your relationship with the federal government, knowing what funding programs are in the Department of Health and Human Services or Agriculture or any of, the, any of those multitude of programs that Elizabeth was talking about uh, and being obviously being successful in getting the money because it's not a question of like you get that money and you're you're contributing to the federal debt no 
If Nevada doesn't get that money, that just leaves more money for 49 other states to do a better job at helping their cities and their people deal with poverty, escape poverty. Continue on his theme a little bit. But what she was saying earlier, though, this trend that we see on the, on the graph started way before the recession in 2007. It's always been climbing up. Uh, take out the recession in 2007, and we still have that growth of the poverty level in urban centers and, and rural communities. Uh, we're talking about refunding it from the federal level and the city level and the state level. A lot of these people do not want to be in poverty. Uh, they're not there on purpose. What can we do to help these people out to get out of the poverty without just throwing money at the situation? It's, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, what is your suggestion? And I think that there are, there are levers that can be pulled at the different levels of government as well. So when you think regionally or locally, um, some of that is about making sure people have access to the kinds of opportunities that provide better paying jobs and a pathway out of poverty. So if the, if the good jobs are growing over here, but the affordable housing is, is concentrated down here, that creates a real challenge to try and get those people into those jobs. So some of it's just, it's about planning. It's about making decisions in more integrated ways. So instead of the traditional silos we've often seen about, here's our transportation money, let's build highways, uh, without necessarily thinking about how they relate to where jobs are and where people are living. It's, it's joining that decision up and land use decisions, how we think about zoning, uh, how, we, how we think about using our, our land uh, with an understanding about where the population is, where, where economic development is taking place, and how do we make connections between them. That's one piece of it. Another piece is the skills piece, right? Making sure that people have the training to be competitive for jobs that will pay higher wages or offer kind of career ladders. Uh, to, to, again, get to a more stable economic footing. It sounds like in your education, it sounds like that's what Seattle's doing up in King County. That's right. With the consolidating the data through the seven school districts and trying to get people. That's right, and, and, make it, and that's why they're t they call it a cradle to career approach, because it's like we don't stop trying to improve outcomes just when kids graduate high school. We want to make sure that they're really landing in, in a profession, in a job. Uh, and so they're trying to you know, forge partnerships with local employers and uh, make sure that, that their students are, are competitive for, because there are a lot of good, especially in the Seattle region, there are a lot of good jobs. So it's how do you make sure that those people in South King County can get those jobs and they don't just import labor from someplace else um, and, and those, those students miss out on those opportunities. Um, so some, that, that's, that's, those are critical pieces, I think, that at the regional and local level, some of these more collaborative approaches can really help move the needle on. When you look to state and federal level things, you have things like the earned income tax credit, which helps make work pay, right? It boosts um, the incomes of low income workers and it really, it lowers the poverty rate by more than two percentage points every year. Uh, and, and it has really positive outcomes for kids who are in families who receive that, that um, support. So I think that we have, a, that's an effective program, making sure that that continues to function at, at, at the level at which it's at. And in fact, there are ways to strengthen it for workers without children that has bipartisan support right now. You have Speaker Ryan and many of the Republican presidential candidates um, agreeing with President Obama on something, which is really remarkable. <laughs> it's because it's been proven to be such an effective program. So that can happen at the federal level. States have also enacted uh, earned income tax credits uh, and, and similarly uh, minimum wage increases. So, and I would argue those, those are not either or situations. They're both strategies that together can help work pay more for people who are, who are working. Pick up on that too there. Um, you ask about how does this work at the state level in terms of funding and how it's distributed. There's, our agency has multiple funding sources, but one of the primary ones is the Community Service Block Grant, which is a federal program. The way that it works is there's a base allocation for everyone within the state based on where your service area is. The second part of that is it's an allocation based on the percent of poverty in your particular service area. So for Clark County, we should be getting about 74% about of the allocation. But if we were to do that, no one else in the state would get any money because we have such a high density of poverty here, we just sat all in. What we do is we get about 54% of that and the rest of it is distributed to the rural areas. Mostly Reno, but Alco and some of those places too. 
Well, let's not refer to Reno as a rural area. <laughs> yeah, right. Rural area. Right. They have the second biggest, uh, they have the second largest. We're all community action agencies. There's 12 in the state. Uh, the Las Vegas Urban League is the largest, and then there's CSA in Reno, which is the second largest. So we pretty much handle what happens in terms of poverty in the state. The other piece, you talked about how can you, how can you be more involved and provide access, maybe not just directly to people who are in poverty, but to some of those service providers. Two things. House Resolution 1655 is up for a vote. It's the CSBG Reauthorization Act. That's where we get our funding from. It's about $800 million spread out all over the country. The other piece is volunteer, get involved with your local social services network. We're everywhere. There's about 47 different groups or agencies here within Clark County. But and yeah, you so United Way. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're in, you're in a two million person metropolitan region that is approximately three quarters of the population of the state. So when it comes to allocating resources, there should be an expectation of a certain percentage of resources allocated here. Uh, I thought I saw another, was there a, yes sir? Uh, do you believe all these efforts should be concentrated on a, um, a specific age group or generalized? As in like affecting um, uh, younger people, older? Um, no, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, you know, I think that there, there is a lot of evidence that the investments in early childhood are really critically important, uh, but we can't ignore the needs of the senior population and the working age population. So I think what we've also seen growing um, in, in recent years are efforts to do more of a, a two-generation approach so that you're getting that early childhood investment, um, or even starting in pregnancy or before children are born to really start connecting um, kids to important services. Uh, but at the same time, working with parents to think about what are their workforce and skill building opportunities so that, so that it's happening in parallel. It's not an either or situation. Uh, and I think, I mean, the, we, that sort of stuff is, is really important and I think promising moving forward because you can't, you can't ignore, you know, millions of people that are, that are in need um, just because they may be older or, or facing multiple barriers. I'm going to just stop us here so we can stop on time. If you want to have a question you haven't asked, we'll be around for a few minutes. Let me thank you all for coming. And before, yes, please. <laughs>